just a little background of myself. So I've been here at USC in the senior associate dean role with ORSL for 12 years now. And uh, before this, I worked at Stanford as uh, one of y'all. I was a religious director there for the liberal Protestants, progressive Christians there for about 10 years. Uh, so I had a lot of experience there with students as well. Um, and then before that, I was the founder and then the director of the Homeless Services Agency in Palo Alto, an uh, interfaith organization that served uh, people on the streets. Uh, starting with working with the homeless, you know, at least half of the people we served at the urban ministry organization were at our drop-in center. At least half of them had some diagnosis, psychiatric diagnosis. And we had quite a number of people experiencing psychosis from uh, uh, schizophrenia or uh, bipolar. Back in the day, we'd call that manic depressive. But you can tell somebody to go to a psychiatrist, eh, then what? You know, is it going to happen, particularly if they're on the streets? So somehow there's got to be trust. There's got to be personal relationships. Um, and that is why I'm so grateful and that we at the ORSL are so grateful that we have Sarah and Krista because we have just that. We have the personal direct uh, referrals that we can make. They'll explain later the fine, the fine print on that, how that works. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than just calling them up. Uh, but we have that connection and it's just been gold for us uh, uh, in our work. Um, it's a two-way street, uh, counseling mental health at USC. Uh, we refer people there, but they also refer people to us. And uh, that is beautiful. Uh, when they pick up that, that a uh, student really, in addition to therapeutic intervention, also could benefit from a conversation with a religious director or from myself or Vanessa, they, uh, they send people over all the time. So that's that's the beautiful two-way street that we got going here. And in my work with homeless people, I was trying to do the same thing, right? Uh, have those relationships with the therapists and with the organizations that could serve these folks and then make personal direct um, referrals. Uh, first having to build up that trust. Now, how do you build up trust with someone who is in acute psycho psychotic situation? Uh, uh, state. Um, what I learned in that role was uh, that the utterances of folks going through psychosis uh, were full of meaning for them, subjective meaning, right? The experiences that they were going through were, were in just absolutely vivid, right? As real as us looking at our screens right now, just as real as that for them, that's uh, as it is for us looking at our Zoom, that's what it was like for them in their psychosis. And I also began to notice uh, patterns and uh, themes, if you will. I began to start to appreciate the meaning structure of these psychotic uh, episodes and the, and the, the language and the, the um, presentation that folks on the streets made in that state. Uh, very often, uh, uh, folks going through psychosis used religious language to express their experiences. And I observed that a number of these folks had no religious affiliation before they went into psychosis. Really interesting, huh? Uh, I, I met a lot of Jesuses. Right, people who were as sure that they were Jesus Christ as I am sure that I am Jim Burklaw. Okay, and I began to respect uh, the reality of that experience for them, and began to see that that uh, this that the language of religion, uh, Christianity, in particular, because it's the majority religion of our culture. Uh, but other faiths as well, that the language, the imagery, the symbolic and meaning structure of religion 
uh, is a very powerful uh, mirror, if you will, of the structure of the psyche uh, as it is revealed, uh, the universal structure of the psyche as it is revealed in people's experiences of psychosis. So that, I began to pay attention to those meanings and respect them and not argue with them, but kind of go with them. Now that doesn't mean you have to agree with the person uh, when they say that they're Jesus Christ or whatever they're saying, um, not agree in the sense of saying, oh yeah, you're the same as Jesus of Nazareth and walked the earth 2000 years ago. Uh, but to, to honor that experience and, and work within that frame of reference that they've presented uh, opens us up to a, a level of trust and respect uh, that then, in my experience, uh, enabled me to make good referrals that would stick, right? So instead of arguing with somebody about whether they were Jesus or not, I would say, well, you know, uh, the Christ uh, uh, received, asked for, and received help, right? Uh, Jesus, when he was uh, out in the desert for 40 days, at the end of that difficult period, uh, angels came and ministered to him, right? When he was hungry and tired, he would go to Mary and Martha and uh, Lazarus's house for a break, for help. Jesus needed his disciples for help. It's like, you know, you need to be strong so you can deal with the demonic forces that are acting within you. Um, I have some su suggestions about ways that you might get stronger so that you can do your work, do your ministry, right, in the world. I mean, I've had that conversation dozens of times in my career working with homeless and with students. Uh, this sets up, um, a, 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 this is working with the person from within their meaning structure, not arguing with their meaning structure, not trying to give them a different meaning structure, working inside of the language and the mode of expression that they have for their subjective, powerful, vivid experience. Uh, a couple things came out of that for me. One was, um, again, you know, I found that this approach to people in this situation, uh, that this approach um, enabled me to make referrals that would stick, right? Building trust so that they would actually follow through on their connection with mental health services. Um, but it also gave me a deeper appreciation for my own religious commitments. Right, I, had a deep, I learned a lot about the Bible from hanging out with mentally ill people, okay? That's a whole other discussion. But it brought me deeper. It made me more conscious of my own uh, psyche and spirituality and soul and uh, helped me to find more meaning um, in my religious tradition as a result of these encounters. Much more I can say about this. This is really more of a teaser for conversation. But I, you know, I've just this past year had a couple more of these similar conversations with students in the course of aiming them over to Sarah and Krista and the team. Uh, so I, I commend this convo to you all. Uh, <laughs> I think it's it's uh, we have we have a very special role I think as religious directors and religious professionals on campus. Um, in uh, serving our students' mental health and, and in uh, making best use of the resources that we have available on campus to serve them when they're in trouble. Psychosis is only part of the package here. That's uh, a, probably a relatively minor aspect of uh, what Sarah and Krista and the comp and company encounter. So um, let's hear from them. Uh, Sarah, could you share a bit about your own experience? Uh, with the subject of the intersection of spirituality and mental health. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so I know most folks, right? I'm Sarah Schreiber. 
I am um, a licensed clinical social worker at um, USC Student Counseling Services. And I've been um, helping to liaise between student counseling and ORSL for this will be going into the fourth year, um, which has been real cool to be here for a minute. Um, and, you know, I think I'm really glad that Jim is convening this conversation just because I spend so much time in the mental health world and I have this sort of taken for granted sense of how I and my colleagues work with um, religion and see it intersecting with, um, you know, the mental health work we do. But um, I think it's wrong of me to make the assumption that you all know what we're doing or how we're thinking about it. And I think that, um, you know, being transparent about that and open up opportunity for folks to ask questions or, or hear how we're thinking about it is important in gener in building, you know, the trust that would enable referrals for students. Um, so happy to be having this conversation and look forward to hearing from you all in questions. Um, you know, so a little bit about me, I'm gonna, you know, I'll disclose a little bit about myself personally in service of sort of explaining my perspective on this, right? So I, I identify as Jewish um, and have found for myself that religion has been an important source of meaning making in my life. Although, because I also identify with LGBT community and have certain other intellectual and political commitments, there's had to be a lot of ways for myself that I've, I've navigated things. Um, and had, had to find um, ways that religion works for me and doesn't work for me. Um, and then also like many progressive Jews, I dabble in Buddhism because that's just kind of what a lot of us do. So it's a joke for the Jews, no one's laughing. Okay, moving <laughs> on. There we go. Um, okay, so, um, so, you know, when I work with students, Oh, and another thing about me is I've done a lot of interfaith work, which I found really rewarding, right? I've been part of Jewish Muslim dialogue programs. Um, mm. I had worked in the past with LA Voice, which is a sort of progressive interfaith community organizing group. I used to be a lay leader with a Jewish congregation in LA Voice. And I, I found interfaith work to be really powerful. Um, and so when I look at religion and mental health, I, I come at it fundamentally from a place of believing in my heart of hearts that religion can be a really important source of making meaning, of finding connection and community, and that what works for me religiously is not necessarily what works for someone else religiously and vice versa, and that that's fine, right? That I don't have any desire to figure out what's what's the right thing, what's the right particular religion or, re or religious belief system for somebody else. But I believe that the enterprise of making meaning is something really important that I don't think we do enough of as humans these days, right? So that, that's really where I come from. Um, and so with students, I think, you know, there, there are a certain there's always going to be in this age group a certain um, segment of the population, probably, you know, ballpark at a 3% or so who's experiencing some sort of psychosis or, or uh, bipolar disorder because those things often onset right in late teens, early 20s. Um, and I'm going to defer to Jim on that, right? I think the way he approaches it is beautiful. We do see religious kind of imagery popping up in those cases. Um, and the, right, the trick as Jim articulated is finding a way to help that person feel validated and understood and, tr and build a trusting relationship while also at least in this country's mental health system working on getting them on medication, which is sort of the best that mental health system currently has to offer. Um, but I, I think where I see it popping up most often with students is when people encounter um, some big thing that makes them kind of quite that challenges their 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 meaning system, 
right? So I, I see this often in students who have experienced a significant loss of a parent or of a peer. Um, I see it also sometimes with LGBT students who maybe come from a certain religious background and now find themselves in conflict between, um, you know, who they are, what they're feeling inside and sort of what they've learned growing up. And, you know, what I really look to talk about with students um, is I, I, I look to understand what role their religious orientation or even if they're not religious, but they have a sort of unspoken or unconscious theology, if you will, that, um, you know, this bad thing happened because I was bad, right? Or bad things happen to bad people, bad things shouldn't happen to good people, et cetera, right? So really look in whether it's spoken or spoken in a religious way or, or just, or in a non-religious way, just kind of looking to understand, like, how are they making meaning of, of this hard thing, of this hard situation? And if they do identify with a particular religious tradition and it's not one that I'm real familiar with, right, looking to find out a lot more from them about how they understand it and, um, how that works for them and not, not making assumptions or judging or thinking that I know, because um, that's, that's not my place at all. And then I think, um, you know, from there, what I'm looking for is whatever the belief structure is, what are the ways this is working for them, right? Supporting them and moving through the situation um, and growing as a human being. And are there places they're getting stuck? And, um, if they are getting stuck, right, not telling them they're wrong or contradicting what they believe, but looking to understand that. And if it is, does seem to be a, it's often, right, the sort of theological question around, like, I did everything right, so the right thing was supposed to happen, and it didn't, right? So what's wrong? Um, and I think particularly with a lot of USC students who are socialized, right? You work really hard and you get all the internships and you get good grades and then you're going to get a good job and have a beautiful life and live happy. And we all know that that's not how life works, but nobody's telling them that, right? Um, so they run into the first big failure or loss or disappointment and all of a sudden they're suicidal because they, you know, nobody told them this was going to happen. Um, so really helping to start explore or even helping them understand like okay so this is one way of looking at things you do everything right and then the right thing happens did you know there are other ways of looking at this right there are other ways of understanding why things might happen to us um and there are religiously oriented student right introducing the idea that theologians have really different ways of understanding this and that can be, uh, you know, sort of an open door to referring them back to you guys um, to really talk through these questions um, in a thoughtful way, rather than just sort of getting stuck in this, uh, getting stuck in whatever place they're in. So those are some of my, some of my thoughts. Um, I don't know if you want to turn to Krista, um, yeah. talk a little bit about her perspective. Krista. Thank you, Sarah. Beautiful. Krista, take it away. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Krista Nelson. I just, I mean, I first want to say that Sarah just really did a magnificent job of talking about um, such a beautiful way that I think it's, it's both so um, personal to every clinician, but then I, I think she really did a magnificent job of really capturing kind of the spirit of looking at the intersecting um, components of religion, spirituality, and mental health. Um, so I, just to um, let you know a little bit about me, I, um, the ink is still drying on my degree from Fuller. Um, yay! So I um, just graduated with a PhD in clinical psychology um, from Fuller Theological Seminary, and I have a master's in theology as well from there. And so that's, I think that's really important because I, um, have training as a psychologist, but then my, <clears throat> where I come from specifically in looking at these things is from a very, um, Christian 
sort of Christian broad um, tradition. And so that's, um, that's just something to, to know about me. Um, I've been at CMH for two years and have gotten the, the true joy of getting to be a co-liaison with Sarah. Um, I'll be moving on to the Core Check Center next year. So maybe I'll be a familiar face if I can um, sneak onto some hobby liaison next year with, with you guys. But um, anyway, Sarah's your, um, your person, but it's been a real joy to get to be working specifically within, um, with you guys and with, you know, having my eyes specifically on students of religious backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> just to add to what Sarah's saying, I think a couple of things that, uh, I kind of the, the lens at which I, I wear is that, you know, we all make meaning in different ways. And so as soon as a student will talk about religion, I think something that we talk about a lot as therapists, and, and I think I, I used to be on a pastoral staff as well. So I, I think this is very um, interdisciplinary is really noticing what comes up for you. And so noticing what comes up for me, and I, I was sharing with Jim and Sarah that I sometimes find that when working with students who are um, very similar to me in terms of like theological or spiritual background, that's where I really need to catch myself because making these assumptions, whereas someone who comes from a very different tradition, I, I find that there's <clears throat> a lot more to find out in that way. And so I think first I'll start with a number of questions of like really trying to make no assumptions and finding, um, I had a professor at Fuller talk about finding the student's temple within the temple of like finding their own spiritual orientation or belonging within the umbrella of belonging, because this is the time of individuating, differentiating, finding your own identity. And so many times students will get, just like what Sarah was talking about, of something happens and we're faced with the problem of evil or the problem of change or the problem of, um, hardship and then you say oh man at my my youth pastor maybe didn't prepare me for this of like what what happens when i now am questioning some things uh what happens when i see things differently uh do i belong anymore i think something that feels so moving to me is sort of a crisis of not so much a crisis of faith but a crisis of do i fit do i fit in my uh within my spiritual group anymore what what happens if i change and so I'll start with, with questions of really dialing it down, of, of saying, you know, like who, um, and I, I use the word God, but really finding the student specific language too, but seeing like, who is, who is God? Where is God? What is God like? What are the characteristics of God? You know, finding, seeing where the student is in relation to this higher power, um, no matter what orientation they're coming from and seeing what, um, what symbolic and literal meaning does God have in their lives in a way of finding, helping the student to really navigate where they can drop an anchor in terms of meaning, comfort, um, maybe how they relate to me as someone even in this conversation. And so, um, and I think where this comes from me is that there's a lot of, research that talks about, um, I don't know if folks are familiar with attachment theory, but it's, it's basically the, the idea that a lot of, uh, for every human being, we're all wired for relationship and that in, when we're really young, the way that we get our needs met dictates the, a lot of times can really impact the way that we relate to others for kind of the rest of our lives. Um, and so, uh, healing others coming into the picture can really make a difference in the way that we relate to others and get our needs met, feel close to people. Um, and that God as called a compensatory attachment figure can be a huge catalyst for healing. And so looking at some of the most moving conversations, this is just one example of a lot of things. Um, but, you know, looking at how um, a student believes that God feels towards them, based on the student's belief and understanding of, of God as a personified figure or a loving other. Um, and then really helping to use that based on what the student is wanting and looking for um, can be hugely powerful in terms of helping the student move towards healing. Like what Jim is saying, moving towards receiving help. 
that's so hard. Sarah and I have the luxury of um, students leave our office, you know, goodbye. They, they go on and live their beautiful lives and, and then they call you, you know, so I think it's, we really, we know how hard of a job um, each of you have as being someone who's really uh, a more around the clock support for them um, and, and wanting to provide them with support access to services, things like that. So anyway, Jim, that's my, my rambling on, on just the way that some of the ways that I see it just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, but just building on what Sarah was talking about. 